There are many ways to make a living. From your typical 9 to 5 job, to starting your own business or side hustle, growing your investments, utilizing a combination of those approaches, or just forging your own path. All of these approaches have their pros and cons. Some have a high return ceiling, but a bit more uncertainty. Others may not have the highest growth potential, but they are fairly reliable in terms of the growth that they do achieve. Some take a lot of time and effort to get going, or keep going, such as a business or side hustle, while others are a lot more laid back. As a result of these differences, not every approach is going to be optimal for every individual or every circumstance. Which is why today we're going to be discussing a model that tries to visualize some of those more important pros and cons in order to help people find the most optimal income generating paths available to them. The model, which was introduced to me by Mitchell Baldridge, is known as the return on hassle spectrum. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a 30-day free trial of Audible and two free audiobooks of your choice, as well as a list of some books on money I'd recommend checking out with your free trial. The return on hassle spectrum is exactly what it sounds like. It's a chart that attempts to illustrate the relationship between the rate of return on an investment or strategy and the difficulty or hassle related to earning said returns. As Baldridge puts it, it's the amount of money you will save or earn divided by the time, money, and brain damage it takes to get there. I would throw in stress along with the brain damage part, but that's the general idea. The hassle for which the idea is named can take many forms. For instance, stocks would probably be considered a bit more difficult than bonds simply because of the higher levels of volatility that stocks possess in most instances. Now, this could potentially flip down the road if the bonds don't earn you enough money to reach your goals, but in general, for most people, stocks would probably be considered a little bit more hassle-prone due to their volatility. Hassle can also come in the form of time and energy spent to earn the returns. For example, a property manager has to do a lot more work to earn the returns that they earn than a long-term buy-and-hold index fund investor does. For the index fund investor, once they've made their decision on where to place their money, the job is mostly done. Ongoing contributions can be automated in many cases. Dividends can also be set up to be reinvested automatically. All the investor really has to do at that point is keep earning enough money to make the contributions. Whereas the property manager has to, well, manage the properties. They, or in some cases someone that they hire, have to find and manage tenants, perform maintenance on the buildings, deal with all the paperwork related to the properties, and so on and so forth. Here's an image from Nick McGilley's site of dollarsanddata.com that gives you a broad idea about how some of the more common investments stack up in terms Terms of their return per unit of hassle. I should note that many of the strategies depicted here on this chart have their expected returns determined in a more relational sense and often assume a reasonably good outcome. What I mean by this is that not every business you start is going to be earning you double digit returns on an annualized basis just as not every individual stock you pick is going to earn you 8% a year. In fact, if many studies on the topic are to be believed, for most people, an active stock fund, or picking individual stocks themselves, will, over the long run, underperform a more passive investing strategy. Assuming, of course, that the funds are in the same category. For instance, a stock picker picking mostly large cap companies being compared to an S&P 500 index fund. But you probably have to believe that these more hassle-prone strategies will pay off with at least a slightly higher return if you're going to be putting in all the extra work to take that path. And for the most part, in reality, if you do experience a reasonably good outcome from the strategy, then yeah that is likely what will happen. Picking individual stocks would likely outperform sticking with a passive fund if you happen to be one that gets a relatively good outcome from the majority of your selections. Just as a reasonably good outcome for a business startup will likely outperform a more well-diversified investment portfolio, which is why they are depicted in the order that you see. Anyways, as you can see, simple investments like treasury bills and U.S. bonds, which are not too terribly difficult to get into, and usually don't come with a ton of volatility, at least relative to some other types of investments that are depicted here, leads them to having a lower level of hassle than some of the other investment vehicles pictured. Granted, relative to many of the other investment types, the expected returns on treasury bills and US bonds are not the highest, so they end up on the lower left-hand section of the chart. Other strategies, such as building a portfolio of rental real estate or starting your own business, has the potential to produce outsized returns, given the fact that the right business can turn 
turn you into a multi-millionaire, if not outright a billionaire. And real estate has several tax advantages in addition to seeing its returns, in the form of cash and equity, being magnified through the use of leverage. Now, one thing that this chart doesn't illustrate that I think is worth taking into consideration for some of the strategies is that the return on hassle can shift over time. I hinted at this earlier with the stock and bond example, but let's put some numbers to it to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Let's take John, who's a 25-year-old looking to retire at 65 on the equivalent of a $40,000 a year income today. Based on the 4% rule, we know that John would need to amass an inflation-adjusted nest egg of about $1 million in order to meet that goal. If he has $500 a month to invest, then some simple calculations would suggest that he needs to earn an average annualized return of a little over 6% per year after inflation for the next 40 years to reach his goal. Based on Nick's chart and the historical data that we have available to us, a passive stock index fund would have a decent shot of hitting that mark. For instance, even after the down year that we had in 2022, the rolling 40-year inflation-adjusted return by the end of that year for the total stock market was about 8%. However, if John went with bonds, which over the same time frame had returns closer to 2 to 4.5 or so percent per year, depending on if you're looking at short-term or long-term bonds, John would miss his goal by at least $340,000, or a bit north of 8 years worth of work. That's quite a lot of extra hassle to deal with at the end for John. Now, whether that makes up for the extra day-to-day -day stress that he may have experienced in the early going due to the larger volatility of stocks is a decision that only John can make, but it is something worth considering. Depending on your specific situation and goals and risk tolerance, the general level of hassle associated with earning returns for any given investing strategy can shift over time. Another great example of how the return on hassle can change over time is with real Real estate. Now there's a lot to learn when you first get into building a real estate rental portfolio. However, at least some aspects of it do get easier to manage the more experience you have with it. Things like managing the tax situation or spotting deal breakers on new properties are some examples. The first time you go through it, you have to learn all the ins and outs, and of course make all the beginner mistakes that come along with it. But once you've done it a handful of times, it tends to be a lot more straightforward. You know the procedures, and you know what to look for, and what not to look for. You may still make mistakes, but they'll be fewer and further between and you'll tend to get things done quicker than you did the first time around. And this isn't even taking into consideration the fact that the risk tends to get lower as you build up your portfolio. Over the years that you spend buying up properties, your cash flow increases, but eventually some of those earlier mortgages start coming off the books once they've been paid off. So your cash outflow actually decreases, at least proportionally speaking. This leads to you having greater net profits, and therefore more financial resiliency to deal with any unfortunate events that might come up, as they always do eventually. Then there's the possibility that you can start outsourcing some of the labor to a property management firm. This may not be the easiest thing to do in the beginning when your cash flow is relatively low, but as your portfolio grows, it is an option that becomes more realistically available to you. Put all these things together, and over time, the hassle associated with managing a real estate rental rental portfolio can drop quite substantially over the long haul. But that's the return on hassle spectrum. It may not be a concept that we vocalize very often when talking about finance, but the idea of finding the right balance between long-term returns and day-to-day -day lifestyle satisfaction through the minimization of, well, BS for lack of a better word, is something that we all grapple with when making financial decisions. Not everything is about money, and not everything is about maximizing returns. Nor is everything about minimizing risk. It's all about finding the right strategy at the right time for the right person. And that's something that drawing up our own return on hassle spectrum can help us to figure out. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. If you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.